We're very pleased to have Jean-Noé Landry here from Open North, and he is going to provide us with a retrospective on how open data is evolving, how it's evolved over several years, and possibly where it's going next. So over to Jean-Noé. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, and first off, just want to really congratulate and commend all the effort that was put into the organization of the, of the summit. Uh, to Mary and to Paul, uh, Niagara Connect, and everybody who helped out. Uh, it's a huge endeavor. You know, we just have to show up and say a few words or sit, take notes, and have nice chats with, with folks. But organizing events uh, that are central to community building uh, is something that I think we need to, to recognize as a community and as a movement as well. So thank you very much for all the effort that was put into this. Um, I'm going to... Yeah, please. Okay, so I'm going to uh, partly do what I was committed to, to doing. I'm not going to give you a, a detailed retrospective about the state of open data in Canada and how it's evolved um, over time. That would be probably a full course load, you know, over kind of several days in a workshop. And I think one of the challenges of the open data community is that we can even question, is there a community? Or are there many communities of practice that utilize open data for their different purposes? So as a room full of people that are uh, engaged and passionate about data and open data, I think that's one of our kind of fundamental questions. Um, I'm going to start more on a kind of uh, a bit of a re reflexive, kind of self-reflexive note about Open North. Um, and how we have evolved over the years, because you know we have this one uh, kind of touch point uh, officially as the as CODs has been organized over the last five years, and it just kind of struck me how our own role and the way that we work with open data and some of our activities have actually evolved over the last um, maybe seven or eight years since we were founded in 2011. And I, I share that as a starting point, not to kind of wave the open north flag, but also, but principally just to kind of um, use our own experience as an indication of the way that the community is evolving itself. Okay, so let me go into that. Um, and then I want to take a kind of a, a global kind of perspective on uh, the state of open data. I'm going to be talking about the open data barometer. I'm going to talk about some, some work that we've done with IDRC, the International Development Research Center, for a project called the State of Open Data for the World. And I want to shift toward some of the kind of emerging risks, um, some of the trends that we're seeing, and uh, uh, finish on a note about open smart cities and kind of operationalizing openness beyond open data. And I think some of those themes have already kind of are coming up already in some of the, the talks that we've had so far. So it's kind of strange, you know, to kind of start and talk about us, but I just want to, it just kind of really struck me as I was preparing this that I wanted to share that with you. So Open North was founded in 2011, um, and some of the work that we did then and some of the work that we are doing now has really kind of shifted, right? And there's different kind of ways of looking at this. So initially, we were asked to provide input on, you know, uh, the adoption of some of the first open data licenses in, in Canada. Um, and now we've been much more engaged at the international level. We also do that, but we, we've also been quite engaged internationally through the International Open Data Charter uh, that you've heard in the presentation uh, given by, by Hillary earlier uh, this morning. So the whole notion around um, you know, core principles, the normative framework of, of what it is that we call open data, um, and the revision that's ongoing right now, we're part of those discussions. Um, and I'll unpack some of that a bit later on. Uh, we helped build some of the first open data portals in, in Canada. Um, and now we've kind of shifted our, uh, our commitment more towards a context-driven approach to data user engagement. You know, like I'm, we'll probably hear uh, this in the next like, couple of days, but the, uh, the saying that if you build it, they will come, we know that doesn't work, right? It's not that easy. If only it was that easy, right? But it really isn't. And so, you know, shifting towards a, a problem Framing approach, understanding the users, their needs, understanding the context from which they're from, the types of issues that they're interested in, uh, and barriers to engagement from a capacity building perspective is, is critical. Um, we, all, we were also organizing hackathons 
Um, and we don't do that as much anymore, although hackathons still have their raison d'être, right? There's still a, a reason why hackathons should take place. Um, now we're, we're more focused on brokering kind of shared multi-stakeholder governance uh, arrangements, uh, which takes repeated touch points in order to convene different groups of stakeholders and understanding that, well, actually, sometimes the conversation goes beyond uh, closed to open, and we need to look at that gray zone in the shared kind of data spectrum and unpacking those issues and then understanding, well, what are the enabling conditions for a specific stakeholder group um, which all, with all of its diversity and complexity to create enabling conditions to share data that they're collecting themselves and then tapping into other sources of data to collectively um, analyze the types of issues together so that they have uh, a realization that they have more to gain by sharing data under the right conditions than doing all the work themselves. Um, we're now also, um, well, we used to do a lot of research on, on open data standards, um, and now we're, we've been quite involved with uh, MISA Ontario um, uh, through a pilot on multi-jurisdictional data interoperability. So going from principles of interoperability, unpacking that, but then doing the real work of actually implementing and realizing interoperability with different municipalities together, right? Uh, and then lastly, um, we, were, we still do some of this, but tool building, creating kind of supply and demand, uh, we've shifted our approach now much more towards an applied research uh, uh, framework uh, and a team that Open North has, uh, has developed. And I'll talk a little bit later about the Open Smart Cities approach. So you can see how, you know, we're almost kind of a, uh, a mirror image in a way about how the open data community itself has shifted, at least from the nonprofit perspective. So I just wanted to kind of share that and just kind of name those issues. Okay, so Canadian open data successes. Obviously, this is not an, extend, an extensive or an exhaustive uh, list, but there are some things there that I think are, are worth mentioning at the international stage and at the Canadian stage. Um, and I often like to kind of remind ourselves um, that um, there is often a, a bit of a, a bit, maybe less now, but there used to be quite a big discrepancy between uh, Canadian, the Canadian government's uh, leadership on the global stage and the perception of what Canadians in Canada thought about what the government was doing locally or nationally. So thinking back about, right, thinking back about uh, the previous administrations, okay, um, probably a lot of people would be quite surprised to know that during the previous administration in Canada, uh, Canada was uh, leading the way in developing the International Open Data Charter. Canada was the co-chair of the Open Data Standards Working Group for the Open Government Partnership. Meanwhile, back in Canada, there's a lot of stuff that was happening that, you know, in a crowd like this, we would argue ran directly, like diametrically opposite to, you know, the core principles of, the, of open government. Census, you know, whole bunch of stuff, right? And so I just like to think that, you know, it's important for us to kind of remind ourselves of, of that. So there's a story there about the Canadian leadership story. Um, there are, obviously, the, when we talk about Canadian open data successes, we're not just talking about the, the government. There's a lot of Canadians that are doing really, really amazing work in the open government and the open data space globally. And I think that's worth noting as well. So think of Godan, which is focused on agricultural data, think of open contracting, IADI. There's a number of different stakeholder groups where Canadians, through their kind of typically Canadian, kind of soft kind of diplomacy or kind of brokering, kind of mediation, kind of, you know, the, the things that um, I think a lot of us kind of like to think about ourselves, right, these types of qualities as enablers and mediators and kind of uh, brokers, that resonates and there's a place there when we talk about data and when we're involved in these communities of practice internationally. Of course, internationally, we've got um, a great opportunity as uh, the Canadian government has become the co-chair of the Open Government Partnership. There's going to be the Global Summit in Ottawa uh, in May. A tremendous opportunity to um, kind of collectively as, as, a, as a community and as communities of practice utilizing open data um, to really kind of raise the bar uh, internationally, but starting from home and looking at what we can do here. Um, I was quite inspired by the... The, the presentation that was just before me um, uh, from an indigenous perspective, um, 
and I think there's a great opportunity to have a intercultural dialogue on the global stage where we not just attend an event where indigenous leaders are talking to us about open data and OCAP, but actually kind of unpack and kind of, kind of go through a process of understanding what does it mean to me? Because there are different worldviews here. And from a, uh, the, the work that we've been able to do with indigenous leaders has been probably some of the most inspiring and challenging work uh, because it really fundamentally challenged our conceptions culturally of what we mean by data and kind of open up our mind to you know, alternative uh, worldviews. Um, so I think the OGP summit will be a good opportunity to have that conversation. Um, and we were ranked, Canada, the Canadian government was ranked number one in the latest edition of the Open Data Barometer. I'm gonna talk a little bit about that. In Canada, um, there's the uh, open by default pilots um, that are noteworthy, okay, if you're not familiar with them. Uh, we've got Minani and, and her team from TBS uh, Canada that are here that have been doing uh, this work. Uh, we also have different types of dialogue that's taking place between di different levels of, of government. Interjurisdictional um, approaches uh, require a lot of effort, and Canada is really well positioned to uh, demonstrate um, not only the need, but a way of being able to uh, broker conversations between different levels of government, whether it's federal, provincial, or regional, or um, at the local level. A lot of countries face that type of challenge as well. And I think there's a really interesting kind of momentum that's taking place there. Um, and then I've already uh, mentioned the, uh, the Smart Cities Challenge. Um, there's a few, I think, cities that are here that are uh, among the, the finalists for the Smart Cities Challenge, and there's gonna be another event um, in Toronto, actually, that's happening right now on the Future Cities Summit to talk about that. But at the core of the Smart Cities Challenge is the element of openness, which is great. It wasn't there before. When they were starting to uh, think about the Smart Cities Challenge, it was gonna be a Smart Cities Challenge. What is a smart city, right? We could spend, you know, another course load unpacking all the different definitions of, of what is a smart city. But what is an open smart city, I think aligns really well with our interests and our values as a community from an open data perspective. So I was really pleased to see that openness was part of the Smart Cities Challenge. Um, okay, so the Open Data Barometer, Canada being in the first top spot, okay. Um, the methodology was a little bit different for this year. They focused mainly on 30 uh, countries as opposed to 100. Um, this is one of the main uh, indicators or indices that exist internationally to measure, you know, how do we measure and track progress as a community? Super, super challenging. Um, I invite you to, uh, to go and, and look it up. Um, and, whoa, sorry. My computer did something strange. No updates now, not the time, just a second. <laughs> just a second. <laughs> uh, I just wanna read you that quote, just a sec. Here we go. All right, Canada has advanced steadily, retaining its position as a top performer for the past five years and rising to the top in this edition. This government's continued progress reflects a strong performance in virtually all areas, from policies to implementation. Its consistent political backing has been one of the keys to its success. As Canada starts to show substantial evidence of the impact of, its, of this focus on open data across the government, social and economic sectors, we can see this approach starting to pay off. So I'm not here to advocate on behalf of the government of Canada. I'm not, I don't work for the government of Canada. Let's be straight, okay? But I think it's important to know how people perceive the government of Canada and then raise some questions about whether or not we as a community agree with the way that the government of Canada is being measured and recognized for its success. This is obviously based on kind of rigorous analysis, so there is merit to, to this, and I think it's important to recognize its leadership position, but I think it's also important for us as a community to question that and to ask those questions to see whether or not we agree with this. So from uh, the Open Data Barometer, they identified five key uh, challenges that they're seeing among the 30 governments that they ranked uh, this year. And I, I want us to kind of look at those and uh, to wonder whether or not we think that the Canadian government is leading by example in these areas and what is our collective and individual responsibility in order to raise the bar because there's always room to grow, okay? Like even if it's at the top, there's a lot more that we can do. So one of the main challenges, sorry from the top, Better policies, but modest results. So this is from the perspective of an international perspective. 
So are we content with the quality of the policies uh, in Canada? Do we think that the licenses and the terms of reusability actually align in a way that facilitates reusability of, of data across jurisdictions? Let's put it there. Um, a few governments, and that was mentioned also by, uh, by Hillary in the case of Ontario, have adopted the Open Data Charter. Why aren't more cities and governments adopting the Open Data Charter in Canada? What's the blockage there? Data openness requires resources, not just political will. So I think that we've seen that there's been kind of uh, a significant push from the Treasury Board Secretariat, and we're seeing that across governments, actually across provinces and in, in cities as well. But how do we ensure that we're not subject to um, uh, the coming and going of political administrations in, in Canada? Um, we have our own instability when it comes to uh, uh, the achievements that we think that we've uh, uh, attained, and Ontario is a, a good place for that. So how do we navigate that? How do we entrench our successes? This is something that requires us to be vigilant and actually mobilize in a way that we can't take things for, for granted. Uh, it's when things are going well that you want to make sure that you actually entrench the conditions that will last longer than the current state of uh, what you're dealing with. Promises on infrastructure and community building remain undelivered. Um, so this is quite tough as well. I mean, I think in Canada we can look at the, um, kind of the, the federated uh, open data portal and a lot of attempts to kind of coordinate across jurisdictions to facilitate searchability um, from a federated uh, data portal perspective. Um, however, there are very, very few organizations that explicitly name open data as part of their core mission and the core work in the way that they do. Why is that? There's probably some issues around capacity building, probably issues around literacy, on uh, you know, digital literacy, data literacy. So where are those investments coming from? How do we develop that culture of open data within our own organizations when we're already so busy doing all the important work that we're busy doing, right? Open data can't be something that just kind of sits on the side of your desk. It needs to be an integral part of the organization, its culture, its leadership, how do we empower kind of a new generation of people to work within our organizations and our individual sectors? So how do we do that? I don't have all the answers. I'm just gonna name a bunch of problems that I hope we'll get to talk about over the next two years, okay? Weak legislation impedes the growth of open data. Um, so we could talk, and again, this is probably a whole other seminar, uh, and probably some people that are better qualified than I am to talk about the details of this, but the access to information law in Canada still dates back to the early 80s. Why is that? Okay, there are countries that have open data laws. That's a good, that, that's an interesting concept, right? Um, there are some advantages to, to that approach. Um, but that also means how do we entrench that at the local level, the provincial level, um, et cetera? And why are we not, like, I don't think we need another consultation on the changes that we think we need on access to information reform. I've, I seem to recall that that, took, that process took place not too long ago. So why can't we implement those, uh, those recommendations? Probably a good reason, but let's, let's talk about it. Um, and there is still inadequate evidence of impact of open data. You know, we've got organizations like ODX that are you know, focused on uh, the business side of, of open data. There are businesses, you know, some of them that, that are probably here, using open data. How come we're not telling that story in a coordinated, kind of comprehensive, national way? Who's documenting this? How do we learn from each other? Still a lot to be done in those areas. And I was happy that uh, this was already raised earlier, um, the open by default versus uh, published with purpose, or open by default and published with purpose, right? So what does that mean? How do we unpack that? Because those are, and we, we, uh, we authored a paper on open by default and what it actually implies or means uh, for public servants. And open by default, it's like apple pie. Everybody kind of loves, politically, it's a good idea. It's like, you, everybody loves apple pie, just like you can say, well, you know, open by default, it's something that we should all kind of adhere to. But when you start scratching under the surface of that concept, there's a lot of issues there. And it's one that's been critiqued internationally, and I think also in Canada, for what we call open washing. That you will put some data sets out, 
a lot remains locked into your, your servers and internally within government. You're not releasing kind of your risk assessments of why that is, that that data is not released by default. And then you're left with a good looking open data portal with a lot of really high value kind of open data sets, but that's the tip of the iceberg. How do I, we need to get under the surface, right? So open by default can be a, a useful uh, principle that can actually um, uh, kind of not hide, because I think that's too strong, but it can be used to not show everything and just to say, well, yeah, we were open by default in these cases, but that's not what open by default means, right? So there's a critical analysis that needs to come there. And then pub publishing data with purpose, um, I really like that one, but whose purpose? How do we engage? How do we not just, you know, engage with people who have access to government who have the technical capacity to use data? How do we broaden the conversation around data and connect with probably the people that should be, you know, directly, uh, direct beneficiaries of the way that data could be utilized, but that aren't part of the way that data is being used to design services and strategies and, and whatnot? So I think there's risks in both of these. At face value, they're good, but we need to really look at it from a critical perspective. Okay, I wanna share with you some kind of like top line results from uh, the State of Open Data project that we did. Um, 40 chapters, 60 different experts from around the world funded by the International Development Research Center, um, you know, covering a broad range of, of topics, but categorized in scope in open data communities, overarching issues, global regions, and stakeholder groups. Um, and the reason why I wanna share this is, again, from the perspective of reflecting if the global kind of conversation aligns with what you're seeing here in your day-to-day -day and in your relationship with one another and with government. So internationally, um, part of the discourse that we're hearing is that open data is orthodoxy now, which is both a risk and an opportunity. A risk because of complacency that, yeah, open data, you know, if you talk to, Anybody in government who wants to be kind of fairly innovative, you know, who's heard about kind of, you know, I mean, I hope so, you know, data and open data. Um, it's like something that it's, it's less about we ought to do this, but the how, right, that we heard earlier. Um, but it is true that open data, the open data, open data agenda has made government data more visible. Just like as a basic premise, I think there's kind of some consensus around that. More data has been made available because of open data. Good, okay, but the, the bar needs to be higher, right? Um, it's also true that uh, the open data community has directly and indirectly shaped contemporary debates around data. Also true. It has led thousands of people to engage with, build on, and ask critical questions about data uh, government collects and manages, and has surfaced longstanding issues with the quality and representativeness of data inside governments and revealed the challenges of data-driven policymaking. I think this is a, a key area from an ethical perspective, right? And tracing back through a kind of a, a life cycle, uh, data life cycle kind of approach and understanding who makes the decisions about the data that's being collected and what biases are being introduced at the very, very early stages that have an influence over all the different ways that data is being shared or reused or applied or whatnot. So representativeness in data um, also brings to light um, issues around data poverty. We talk about food deserts in food systems. Well, we should all be also be talking about data poverty. Where are the gaps? Where are the places about which communities uh, or different topics for which we're not collecting good quality data and why? Fundamental uh, questions are also, have also been uh, named through the state of open data. What is the open data community, right? That was kind of my starting point. Communities framing uh, has been challenging. Sectors represent a more complex set of communities and sub-communities. I think one of the most um, kind of, uh, yeah, uh, inspiring kind of work that we've done recently is with urban planners. From a field building perspective, we know a lot about data. Um, they don't necessarily use data in the same way that we do, but they sure know a lot about urban development issues. So how can we come together and then make the value added of open data pertinent for the types of issues that uh, urban planners are, are concerned with. 
that's part of the work that has led us to focusing on uh, open smart cities because of our ability to network and work collaboratively with, with urban planners. How is the level of impact tied to relationship with data? That's, a cent that's central to uh, the community or more peripheral to overall sector objectives. Is it always about data? We heard a lot about relationships in the previous uh, presentation. So how does relationship and data from an intersectorial uh, or multi-sectorial perspective actually have an impact if we know that the data is not neutral? How do we talk about data in a way that acknowledges this? And are we learning the right lessons from successful communities? This is something that I think from a global to local or a local to global approach uh, is very, very critical for us. And I don't want to diminish kind of the initiative that we have, you know, in, in this room, uh, but sometimes somebody else has already thought about, you know, a solution for the problem that you're really focused on. And that's a good thing, right? So we need to kind of strengthen our networks and there are some really, really dynamic um, and quite welcoming and very proactive uh, communities that are out there. And if we look at, um, you know, uh, how open data has become part of a the central discourse in a cluster of communities around anti-corruption, international aid, government finance transparency, or beneficial ownership, these are all very, very well established uh, communities around open data from which, you know, I invite you to connect with them and learn from them and share the work that you're doing. Um, we do work in Ukraine and we've learned a tremendous uh, wealth of knowledge around fighting corruption in Ukraine. And corruption is not just in Ukraine, right? So let's kind of bring down those barriers around, you know, oh, the world, it's a different place. Actually, it's quite similar. We're not that different. Sorry to say that. Or not sorry, actually. <laughs> okay, so let's moving on to some cross-cutting issues that are coming out of the, um, uh, the state of open data. So questioning data creation with a more critical approach to data collection and management. I already talked about the, the life cycle and the need to kind of have these tough uh, uh, questions that can be done from a gender equity perspective, from an indigenous data sovereignty perspective. We're seeing that momentum uh, internationally from a transnational um, movement building perspective. Um, the gender equity uh, lens I think is particularly uh, important and there are groups like uh, Open Heroines uh, internationally that are connecting women leaders across, uh, across the world. Um, it's an attempt at mobilization, it's an attempt at sharing best practices. Um, so if you're interested locally to connect from a gender equity perspective or a gender lens, that's one community of practice you could connect with. Open data has tended to focus on release and use of data rather than creation and management. A focus on the open definition can restrict the space for talking about other meaning of openness, including greater recognition of when closed approaches should be uh, used to protect particular community interests. Um, not everybody wants their data open, but we need to have an open conversation about that. Um, and I, th I know that there's gonna be some panels uh, today that also kind of unpack that, that notion as well. Um, we need to identify what open data end-to-end -end would look like such as exploring the kinds of openness that should apply to data collection, engaging in design and data collection, and being accountable th throughout the process. Um, you know, I talked a little bit about uh, risk assessments that take place within government. I'm, I'm gonna keep saying that because I've, like, I think most of the events that I've gone to over the last year and a half, um, I've talked about this and I haven't seen a government have demonstrated the leadership of sharing publicly their internal risk assessments on the data that they're putting out or not putting out. I think that's a, we talk about open government and we talk about open data and we talk about trust in government. And I think if we had more honest discussions about the reasons why government aren't publishing data, that would probably advance our collective community goals as well. And I can, I can imagine that there's probably government employees in the room that are saying, man, you don't understand. We can't do that or we don't want to do that. And there's a bunch of reasons. At the end of the day, Trust in government is what we're all here, well, trust in, you know, in our political institutions is a fundamental issue that affects all of us, and why not try it? And, you know, I'm, I, I recall some of the early, uh, I've been doing this for 10 years now, you know, and I recall some of the early conversations when people would tell us, ah, oh, but what are they gonna do with our data? You're like, wow, <laughs> right? That statement is like all wrong for so many reasons. 
right? First of all, it's not your data. And then second, just try. And oftentimes, when data is released that you thought was going to cause you all kinds of problems, it often doesn't. And when it does, you have to deal with it and get the stakeholders together around the room and talk about why it's causing a problem. Let's not be blinded uh, by you know, the like, thorny issues around open data. Let's get past those kind of high value data sets that are a little bit less sensitive than those that are you know, more critical and, and more difficult to manage. There is an investment gap and a dearth of institutional capacity for scaling open data uh, infrastructure. Need to understand cost and return on investment and support strategic work to build up data infrastructures in particular sectors. That's quite an interesting kind of area that we're seeing. Uh, and I think there's a quite a few good examples in Canada. Um, uh, data or open data portals for the health sector or for uh, in uh, nonprofit organizations around different issues. Um, you know, I'm, I'm reminded of uh, uh, work that's being done on, on homelessness data uh, and portals to kind of share indicators, or we heard about health uh, indicators as well. Um, so it, open data infrastructure isn't just government infrastructure, and I think we're seeing kind of regional approaches as well. We're in uh, close to Peel region as well, a good example of how you can kind of pool together, um, you know, and kind of gain by sharing resources, sharing capacity, and then look at what's the governance model for sharing data in a common uh, infrastructure to, to make data more available and reusable. Emerging challenges, um, and then next one is more on open smart cities. So emerging challenges, um, so the data space um, is getting broader with many more themes in need of attention, new actors and issues crossing the boundary between open data and wider data policy. Um, there's been a lot in the media recently around um, a call for a national data governance uh, strategy, a uh, whole bunch of issues around, um, around that. And I think it is, you know, open data remains relevant but within a broader conversation around openness and data governance as well. And I think as, as open data you know, activists or open data entrepreneurs or open data, or open data researchers or people who feel uh, passionate about open data, it's very important for us to you know, participate in, in these discussions um, because um, we have a policy, we have a directive. So it's up to us to kind of broaden the way that we scale our momentum and to participate actively in the broadening of the, the data conversation. The open community may be at risk of losing energy and the need to strengthen networks and links between open data and other open agendas. I don't know if you've noticed, but there's been a few, uh, there's been a few events on kind of uh, open first or talking about kind of open kind of more broadly. Um, that's been quite interesting. Um, and maybe, like, obviously, you know, there's a, a room packed full of people here. So clearly, you know, there is vitality in the open data community uh, in Canada right now. Um, but it would be really interesting to kind of survey the group that, that's here and say, you know, uh, in the last, like, year, in the last six months, have you participated in uh, another event or another conference where you kind of shared your perspective on the value added of open data and how it connected to other openness communities, open access, open science, um, you know, you name it. Um, open is, is a set of principles. It can apply to uh, a whole range of issues. Um, need to focus on how to strengthen open advocacy within the wider data landscape from a digital justice, personal data sovereignty. These are really, really important issues. Um, and you know, I kind of thank uh, Sidewalk Labs, actually, for bringing to light issues that were already, you know, part of, uh, <laughs> I'm getting some frowns from, uh, from Bianca right in the front here. Um, no, but I mean it because it's not like we didn't know that there were a lot of issues related to, uh, to data, but, and I think I'm, you know, I think I'm subject to that, is that I wasn't going to talk about digital justice right away. I wanted to get an open data policy. So my kind of short-term goals as an advocate and as an open data you know, uh, organizer and, you know, uh, and leader, I, wasn't going, I, I needed to choose the path of least resistance in order to get uh, government leaders to adopt open data policies. That was the case in Montreal. 
when I helped co-found uh, uh, Open Data, uh, Open Montreal. The reason why we did it is because we wanted to tackle issues of corruption. In our first meetings with elected officials, is that what we said? Of course not. Right? They would have turned away. They would have said, like, yeah, that sounds like a disaster for us. Like, what kind of data do you actually want to have access to? What are you going to do with that data? Hacking corruption? Oh, my God. <laughs> so, you know, I think there's, like, a strategy that comes into advocacy. Um, and I think to the broadening of the openness space, I think we as allies need to connect kind of that mindset that comes from kind of a set of principles and then see how it actually translates into the real world, right? Because there's a lot of people for whom open data is just this really abstract kind of concept, right? So how do we make it relevant there? Um, there are sometimes established technical protocols that embed an open data approach and arguably open data has been essential in the development of some of these sectors. However, substantial commercial players with vested interests can also limit the discourse around openness. Um, procurement is uh, a key area of reform that we need to look at in order to level that, that playing field and understand whose interests are, are being represented in, uh, in different communities. Okay, I'm probably up for, yeah, I'm up there. Okay, I'm gonna start eating into your lunch here. I'm not gonna do that. Um, no, there's another panel afterwards. So I'll end on, the, on a couple of notes. Um, around the notion of operationalizing openness, building on some of the remarks that I've done so far. Um, we were fortunate to, um, to win a, a big RFP for, with Infrastructure Canada as part of the Smart Cities Challenge. Um, we're gonna be establishing a team that's gonna serve communities around the country uh, from a capacity building perspective on um, open smart cities. Um, and that's gonna start early next year and the reason why we're really excited about it, and I don't think I need to tell you all the, the, the reasons why cities have a really important role to play in the open data community. I think if you're here, you're probably already quite active kind of locally and you kind of recognize the, the role that cities have to, have to play. But I think the, um, the way that we're approaching uh, the open smart cities, um, you know, the, well, the, the smart cities challenge and the work that we're going to be doing with Infrastructure Canada and our partners with, with Evergreen and, and others is we need a good definition. Actually, we needed to redefine or define what is an open smart city. Just like, you know, there's a whole literature around smart cities, it was up to us to come up with a way of understanding how can we reconcile principles of openness with all the things that are associated with, with smart cities. So we spent about a year and a half um, with a number of different researchers across Canada to define an open smart city. There's a guide on, on our website, version one, um, open for, for comments. Working from that definition, we unpacked it. Lots there, okay, I'm not gonna go through all of that. And that, uh, next one. Yeah, that scary slide that has too many words that nobody's gonna read. Um, so I invite you to go and, and read the guide. The work that we're doing right now, um, I think will enable us to measure the maturity of open smart cities in Canada over the next several years. And I'm really, really excited about that. Um, and we're gonna make sure that the methodology is, is open and transparent and that the data is, uh, you know, is accessible as well. Because I think if you're going to measure cities, some of that data needs to be available to sustain and feed into a, uh, a conversation about openness and uh, the results of that examination. So we've come up with um, a range of different domains or competencies and, and elements of what is an open smart city. Um, governance, people, standards, data, automated processes, code, software, platforms, infrastructure. Um, and then we came up with, well, what are we going to, to be measuring from a maturity perspective? Is it just going to be impact and benefits and kind of return on investment? Or are we gonna take a principles approach? And this is where you see the openness kind of values kind of seep in here. We've identified 14, we're gonna to have to condense that, right, to make it uh, more usable. But number 12 remains open, but you see how uh, in the work that we're doing right now, Open is linked and is associated with a range of other principles as well that we absolutely need to take into account when we look at 
cities as a whole, from an open smart cities perspective. Um, that work is ongoing right now, so I'm going to stop there. Um, but you know, I invite you to, to stay in touch. Um, we're going to be uh, launching some new initiatives in, in the new year. And if um, and do go to our to our website if you're interested in the the state of open data. Uh, it's meant to be a platform for you know uh, for people that are interested in open data to learn more about uh, how other researchers are looking at data uh, internationally from a range of different topics. And like I said, there's about 30 or 40 chapters that have been write, written there. And I do invite you to look at the open data barometer as well. Thank you very much.